Welcome to Mayor Brown's Tech Talks podcast. Each podcast is designed to provide insights on legal issues relating to technology transactions and keep you up to date on the latest trends in data, digital, outsourcing, and software by drawing on the perspectives of practitioners who have executed technology transactions around the world. You can subscribe to this series on all major podcasting platforms. We hope you enjoy the program. Hello, listeners. Our topic today is protecting against bankruptcy in technology service and license agreements. When bankruptcy happens to one of your key technology customers or vendors, what is the impact on your company and what can your company do to improve its situation before the impact hits? My name is Julian DeBell and I'm your host. I am a senior associate in Mayor Brown Chicago office with a practice focusing on technology transactions. I'm joined today by uh, Richard Asmus, Matt Worgan, and Monique Mulcair. Uh, Richard is a partner in our Chicago intellectual property practice. Rich regularly negotiates strategic IP agreements, conducts intellectual property due diligence, and helps clients navigate IP issues. Matt uh, is a partner in our Chicago restructuring practice. Matt has advised a wide variety of clients in connection with transactions and disputes across multiple industries in connection with out-of-court workouts, bankruptcy proceedings, and other distress situations in complex distress transactions. Monique is a counsel in our restructuring practice from our New York office. Monique has extensive experience in workouts and restructurings, including the sale and purchase of distressed assets. Monique also advises a range of parties on netting-related safe harbor and bankruptcy-related intellectual property issues. Matt, I'm going to ask you first to orient us here and, and describe to us the kinds of scenarios that we are focusing on here in particular. Uh, thank you, Julian. So for the purposes of the discussion today, we're going to consider a hypothetical company facing two potential bankruptcy scenarios. The first is where the company has licensed technology or is providing technology services to a financially distressed customer. The other is where the company has obtained a license or is receiving services from a vendor that is experiencing financial distress. Okay, so from the viewpoint of this hypothetical company or either of these hypothetical companies, uh, what are some of the warning signs that might suggest uh, that a customer or uh, a, a vendor's bankruptcy is impending? Um, and where should a company look for those signs? So there's a variety of, of indicators that could suggest that your counterparty is uh, encountering financial distress. And, and we can divide those into sort of two categories, sort of general signs that would apply across an industry or across the market, and then the specific indicators that would be from your counterparty specifically. So for general signs, we're talking about things like industry-wide problems, like what we're living through right now with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there also may be industry and regional specific events, like what we just saw earlier this year with the winter storm in Texas. For your own counterparty, the specific signs are gonna be the intuitive things like missed payments, an increase in delay in payments, partial payments instead of full payments. Other signs can include things like changes in the nature of the communications with some of your key contacts, uh, changes in management or other key personnel. And then there are things like negative press reports, ratings downgrades, and other performance warnings, uh, reports on financial covenant issues, uh, things like that. Um, and then we have some very clear signs of distress, like the fact that the company is engaging a turnaround manager, uh, a chief restructuring officer, or they've ex executed a restructuring agreement or a, a forbearance agreement with their key stakeholders. Okay, so our vendor or customer or counterparty is showing signs of distress. Um, 
now what? What are some steps that our company should consider that are going to put them in a better position to deal with the changes that it is seeing? So financial distress at a company is going to disrupt the normal course of your commercial dealings. So it's important to be thoughtful in how aggressively you play your hand. And an important first step is to refresh your recollection of the hand that you've been dealt, which means you want to review the relationship and your agreement so that you understand your rights and your options. The, the first step here is to assess the sort of overall impact of the bankruptcy filing by, by the counterparty. Sort of what is the nature and the significance of the relationship with the company? Is it a supplier of a crucial product? Is it a licensor or a licensee of an essential piece of intellectual property? Things like that. Okay, so uh, you've done this kind of assessment now. Now, what does this mean in practical terms and uh, kind of next steps and, and questions to look for? Yeah, so, so getting into the nuts and bolts, the key starting point is going to be reviewing your contract in more detail so that you can understand how does the contract address a breach by the other party? What specific goods and services are they provi providing? What are the default provisions? Are there any cross defaults? Uh, what are the procedures for terminating the contract? What is the term of the contract? Is there collateral that supports the counterparty's obligation or is there a guarantee? Is there some other source of recovery or other source of guarantee of performance if your counterparty starts to fail? And then in addition to what's on the paper, you're gonna wanna understand the history of the relationship with the counterparty. Were there prior defaults? Have there been any other red flags from previous dealings or conduct? Has the counterparty asserted in any way that you have committed some sort of misconduct? Are there statements suggesting uh, that the company has, that you as your company has overstepped your bounds or exerted some undue influence? If you identify these kinds of issues, things like not documenting prior defaults, assertions that you may have somehow violated your side of the contract, you're gonna to wanna to try to clean that record up. Make sure that the written record is clear and that you're communicating clearly. And then, of course, one of the most important steps, the shameless plug here, is to make sure that you're involving counsel as early as possible in the process. The sooner, the better. Okay, and and uh, uh, self promotion aside, why is that? Why why does the company want to retain counsel here? It, in all seriousness, the, the the thing to remember here that is that every action that you are taking in the shadow of a potential bankruptcy, you are taking in the shadow of a possible litigation. Once a company files for bankruptcy the unpaid creditors are going to be looking for any assets of the company that can improve their recovery, and that includes litigation claims. If you work with counsel, that can help to avoid actions or communications that might be interpreted by the counterparty as an implied waiver or as an abuse of your rights. Uh, and those types of, of allegations and issues can hinder your ability to maintain your contract rights and uh, maintain your remedies against the counterparty. Okay. So, all right, let's say the ax now has fallen and bankruptcy has been declared. What options uh, do we have at that point? A anything to avoid? So, the immediate effect of the bankruptcy and sort of the number one uh, principal consideration is going to be the effect of the automatic stay. And the automatic stay is a stay which is under section 362 of the bankruptcy code and it's triggered as the name implies automatically on uh, the filing of a bankruptcy. And the automatic stay prohibits parties from taking any enforcement action outside of the bankruptcy case from commencing or even continuing litigation that's ongoing. And this is one that some people find counterintuitive, terminating a contract. The, the stay prevents you from delivering a notice that would terminate a contract. 
Now, the interesting thing is that you can, if a contract expires by its own terms, that is not prevented by the automatic stay. But if there's any action that's required by the counterparty, um, the stay prevents you from sending that, uh, that sort of notice and um, affecting a termination. And so you are effectively stuck in limbo based on the existence of the automatic stay, which can be lifted for cause, but that requires going into court uh, and showing that there's a basis for you to lift the stay uh, and take whatever action it is that you're looking to take. Um, an important thing to note about the stay is that a violation of the stay has two effects. First, the action that's taken in violation of the stay is void. It's as if it never happened. Um, equally as important and potentially more significant is a willful violation of the stay. So a violation of the automatic stay, when you know that the bankruptcy case has been filed, can subject the party that violated the stay to sanctions, and those sanctions can be punitive and significant. Hmm. All right, so uh, then the key remaining question, it seems, is uh, does the contract uh, or, or license agreement survive? Uh, Monique, how does that work? So. Matt brought up a really important point. Before you start and before the bankruptcy, you need to get very familiar with the terms of your contract and you need to get your counsel in place. Because one of the things that does happen is while the stay stops enforcement proceedings, the debtor as well as the counterparty who's not in debt, not in bankruptcy, needs to continue to perform under the contract until assessment is made. So the most important thing, one of the key powers under the bankruptcy code is section 365 of the bankruptcy code, which allows you, the debtor, to assume, assume and assign or reject a contract. And what type of contract? We're focusing particularly on executory contracts. Those are contracts where there is still performance and obligations on both sides of the contract. So when you have that type of contract, an executory contract, the debtor has the option of assuming, assuming and assigning and rejecting. What does that mean? If you are going to have a debtor who's assuming that contract, that means they are going to continue to perform. They have to continue to pay and complete each of the obligations under that contract and they can keep it. They do not have to make a decision, for instance, immediately at the outset of the bankruptcy that they're going to continue to keep that contract. They can make that up decision anytime up to the, the plan. The next thing is you can also have a situation where the debtor decides that they're going to assume but assign the contract to a third party. What does that mean? If there are any outstanding obligations that the debtor has, like they've missed some payments, they need to come current. <laughs> in order to assume that contract and assign it to a third party. If you have a debtor uh, and they want to assign the contract, you, the party who's the counterparty, you can say, wait a second, I'm not so keen on that assumption. I'm not so keen on that assignment. And you will have to make the argument that your rights are not being protected in that contract. And with the court hearing, there will be a determination of whether that contract is assumable and signable. Last option, the debtor, because this is one of the things that is key about bankruptcy for a debtor trying to get back on a sound footing, they can make an assessment that this contract is not economically viable for them, it's no longer feasible for them, and they can reject that contract. Rejection means that it, the rejection is not the date that they reject, the rejection predates back to the date of filing. So you have a damages claim up to the date of filing, the petition date. So in that case, you're out of luck <laughs> in many situations. You're going, to have to, you're going to have to file that claim for your rejection damages claim and go from there. One of the things, and I'm just going to jump ahead, Julian, one of the things that's unique about Section 365 is that because there were many cases out there that did not really properly assess intellectual property and the value it has, because the bankruptcy code is good with dealing with things, and it was not as good in assessing concepts and what it means to have, you know, Coca-Cola as a name or, or have a special bread making process 
it was not handling very well intellectual property. So the practitioners in the industry said, look, these cases are unfair to the licensor, they're unfair to the licensee, we need a remedy. And so the code was amended to add section 365N. And this is a specific section that deals with licenses. Now, the benefit of this section is really unique because what it says is if you have a licensor becomes a debtor and you are the licensee, instead of being uh, kindly put jammed, we're gonna give you some options. So if the debtor decides to reject the license, instead of just being out of luck, you have the option of saying, A, okay, I take the rejection, I'm gonna just have a rejection damages claims, or B, I still wanna use this license, can I still use this license? And the answer is yes. And you can use the license for the remaining term of the license and any extension under your contractual agreement. So you are effectively allowed to continue to enforce the terms of your license. That comes with the obligation that you must continue to perform under the license. So that if you have a situation where you have payments that you need to make, licensing fees, you must continue to adhere and make those payments. If you have quality obligations, meaning you must have a certain quality standard, you must continue to adhere to that quality standard when it comes to performing under that license. Those are the significant benefits. It's a game changer for those who have IP licenses. But that said, one needs to understand not everything is covered <laughs> as intellectual property. So some of the things that are not covered, you know, surprisingly, I'm gonna go things not covered first, things that are covered. What's not covered are trademarks, though we, we would think they would be, not covered foreign patents, and not covered patents issued after the bankruptcy has been filed. But what is covered are trade secrets, patents generally, a patent application, a variety of plants, and copyright. Pretty broad coverage, very good for uh, parties to licenses. It really enhances and recognizes truly the property value of these intangibles that people have put a lot of R&D into to develop. Okay, that's a lot. Uh, so, so let me just step back here. So we're, we're talking about technology agreements generally. Uh, I, I guess the implication of what you're saying is if we're talking to just a standard technology services agreement, that's going to be governed by um, kind of the basic rules of, of whether the debtor can uh, assume or reject the agreement and you're kind of at the mercy of the, the debtor in that case, but where technology agreements generally uh, involve license of intellectual property to some extent. And to the, to the extent that we're talking about a license of intellectual property, different rules apply that are a little bit more protective of the licensee. Um, Julian, you got it yeah. in one. Go ahead. Julian, you got it in one. Okay, good. So let's focus then on that intellectual property piece because you know that's that's obviously going to be very interesting uh, to both parties. Rich, maybe you can help us understand what uh, uh, what strategies can be deployed by a company to protect its intellectual property rights in bankruptcy, either the the IP that it has licensed out or the IP that it's relying on as a, as a licensee itself. Thanks, Julian. I'm going to concentrate mainly on the situation where the bankrupt party is a vendor of intellectual property, is in other words, the licensor of intellectual property, and you are in the situation of having your vendor either in distress or even worse, in bankruptcy. As, as Monique mentioned, the bankruptcy code does afford a licensee quite a number of protections, but in addition to that, there are self-help steps that a licensee can take to help improve their situation in the event of a vendor bankruptcy. And one of those key concepts is the concept of escrow. So what does an escrow mean? An escrow means when a third party to the transaction 
is holding something of value to one or, or both of the parties. And the typical context where this comes up in technology deals is the escrow of software source code, although it could be other assets, it could be documentation as well. And so in addition to having a bilateral agreement with your technology vendor, you would also have a three-party contract between you, the vendor, and a third-party escrow provider. And what would be placed in escrow would potentially be the source code to the software that you're using in, in object or binary form. The idea being that if your vendor goes bankrupt and, as Monique mentions, decides to reject the contract or otherwise isn't performing, you may be able to step in to perform the services yourself using the source code that is placed in escrow and the bankruptcy is an enforceable trigger for the release of that escrow. So I think that that raises a couple issues that you should think about when one of your vendors in, is in distress. Typically an escrow arrangement will require the vendor to make periodic deposits to the escrow provider of the latest code. So you may have a multi-year agreement in which the software is evolving from version to version, and it won't do you any good if all you have in escrow is version one. You need to make sure you have version two, version three, version 3.1 as they come out. So at the signs of distress that Matt mentioned, one thing to definitely consider is to make sure that those escrow deposits are up to date. Because once the bankruptcy is filed, you may very well be out of luck getting that debtor vendor to update the escrow. There are a couple other things that are related to escrow that you might consider. Uh, one is having a backup service provider. As you know, many software is now delivered, many software products are now delivered as a service. You might consider having a backup service provider that is called for in the contract. You also might consider taking a security interest in underlying intellectual property so that rather than having an unsecured claim in, in the bankruptcy, you may have a secured claim against the IP that's critical for your business. Uh, are there other protections that can be negotiated in a vendor agreement? Yeah, there are a couple recommendations we have. One issue is to make sure that any payments that are made under that agreement are fairly allocated between the IP rights and the other ancillary services you might be getting. So in a typical vendor arrangement, there certainly is often a license of intellectual property. There might be other services that go along with that license. There might be consulting services, development services, other outsource services. And if there's not a clear allocation of what is paid under the license and what is paid for the services, a licensee may be in the position of having to pay for all of those rights, even though it is only getting the right to the intellectual property license after the bankruptcy is, is filed. In other words, if the agreement is rejected, the, the, the debtor is not going to be going to be under an obligation to provide services, even though 365N will protect as to the license of intellectual property. We also recommend making it explicit in the agreement that the, that the intellectual property that is licensed is covered by 365N of the bankruptcy code. As Monique mentioned, we know that not everything is covered, but we can try to bootstrap other types of intellectual property into a mixed IP license. And by mixed, I mean a license that includes both things that are clearly covered, like patents and things that are not, such as trademarks or after acquired intellectual property. So we can try to bootstrap that into the agreement by getting the licensor to agree that it is covered by 365N of the, of the bankruptcy code. There are a couple other good ideas with respect to these agreements. One is to provide a disincentive for rejection, such as a liquidated damages clause. Those can certainly be difficult to negotiate, but if you're in a position where you have enough leverage over your vendor, it's certainly something to consider to have the have the vendor think twice about a rejection. Monique mentioned that your right to continue using that intellectual property under 365N only continues for the term of that license. 
And that means that if you have renewal rights in the license, you can effectively extend the period in which you're able to use the intellectual property of, of the debtor. So certainly something to consider is making sure that the renewal rights are uh, as of right and very clear. Finally, and this is a little bit more exotic, in some instances where there's key intellectual property at issue, you might consider having your vendor transfer that IP for purposes of that license into some vehicle that would be considered a, a bankruptcy remote entity. That often happens in the financing context, but certainly there's the potential in certain IP licenses to have, take that step as well to protect, protect your rights in that intellectual property as a licensee. All right. Well, thank you, Rich and Matt and Monique for for steering us through the complex world of uh, bankruptcy and IP and uh, uh, the risks involved uh, with respect to technology agreements. We appreciate your insights. Listeners, if you have any questions about today's podcast or anything else related to technology transactions and the law, please email us at techtransactions at mayorbrown.com. Thanks for joining and thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this program. You can subscribe on all major podcasting platforms. To learn about other Mayor Brown audio programming, visit mayorbrown.com slash podcasts. Thanks for listening.